Today on the Bander Says Podcast, we'll be discussing YouTube's new feature that will help you earn a bit more money and a couple of other things, so go ahead and stick around. Today we're only covering one real news story and it comes from YouTube. It's that YouTube is rolling out a feature called Super Thanks and this is currently in beta so it's not going to be available for everybody. But this is a way that people can send one-time contributions to a creator. In the past, in terms of monetization, they only had memberships, which was a way that somebody could sign up for a channel, there would be a recurring monthly payment to the creator, and you would get as the contributor, as the person paying the content creator, you would gain access to exclusive content. They also had super chats, which were available for one-time payments to a creator during a live stream chat or during a YouTube video premiere. So you could not do this on any normal VOD. It was only in very specific situations. But over the last six months to maybe a year, they have been beta testing a feature called Applause, and that would allow you to watch any video, any VOD video, and beneath the video, it would have an applause button, and it would allow you to send a one-time payment to that content creator, kind of like a super chat would be. Or if you don't want to become a member and have a monthly recurring payment, you would not have to do that. You could just say, I want to send podcastage $50. I want to send podcastage $50. I want to send podcastage $50. <laughs> Did it work? Did it work? Did anybody go to go send 50 bucks to podcastage? Because I do have this feature engaged now. Engaged now. <laughs> I can't speak. Send me $50 so I can take speaking lessons. But this last week, they released a blog post saying that they were rolling this out to more people. As I mentioned, it is currently in beta test. And now people can send one-time contributions on any video that they're watching. And Apparently, in the comments section, if you send one of these super thanks, your comment will have a special color to it, kind of like in a super chat in a live stream. When you're super chatting, your message gets highlighted. I have not seen one of these comments in person yet, so I do not know exactly how it's going to work. Also, there are some limitations here. You can't put in any amount that you want. You can't put in, I know a lot of people like putting in funny numbers. You can't put in 690 or 69.69 or $5,000 or 33.33.33. If somebody wants to donate me 33.33.33, more power to you, but you can't do it through YouTube. The only four price points that you're able to super thank somebody for are $2, $5, $10, and $50. I think they ought to have a fifth one if they are going to limit it, maybe $20 or $25, because that jump from 10 to 50 is quite drastic. Having a middle ground there may be a good idea, but also we know YouTube is not going to provide this service free of charge. You don't have to pay for it. You're not going to have to pay them $1.99 a month, but they are going to take a cut of every transaction, and it is the exact same cut as a super chat. So YouTube is going to take 30% of every super thank that you get. Just like every super chat that you get, I think it's 50% of advertising, so slightly different there. And what is the other one? Memberships. YouTube takes 30% of that as well. So they are doing a lot of work, and I am perfectly fine with this cut. I know some folks say, I can't believe they're taking 30%. But then I realize, hey, I'm not paying for video hosting. I'm not paying for an algorithm to, to surface my videos. I'm not paying an ad seller. I'm perfectly fine with them taking that. If you don't want to pay that, go set up a, a coffee, K-O-F-I. I think that's what a lot of YouTubers use. And they take a smaller cut. It's one-time donations. You could set up a Patreon Patreon takes less if you don't want to give the 30% for YouTube memberships. There are all of these workarounds. So just keep that in mind. It's just another way to monetize your content on YouTube. And I will remind everybody, do not rely on just one platform because as we saw two weeks ago, three weeks ago, you can get 
deplatformed and deleted for no reason whatsoever, and then you lose all of your revenue. Luckily, I didn't lose all of my revenue. They didn't kick me out of everything. It was a mistake they made, but it shows the how fickle all of this truly is. I will link a bunch of articles in the description. One suggestion for YouTube. As I mentioned, if you are going to have set amounts, include an intermediary between $10 and $50, whether it be $20 or $25. One of those would be fine, but I think it would be great to have the ability for somebody to contribute any amount that they want. And I imagine that's something YouTube will work on, but allowing somebody to donate $2 and up. So they could donate $500 if they really like you. Cool. That would be great as opposed to limit, limiting them to 50 bucks. Just a thought and something I would recommend. And as I was saying, I will have the, uh, the blog post that announced this in the description. I will have their policy thread on Super Thanks in the description. And then I will have a Google support thread on this, on Super Thanks in the show notes as well. So you can check all of that out if you are at all interested and that's actually all the news that I wanted to talk about. There was nothing else of interest to me. As I was going through all the tech blogs, though, I did notice an exorbitant amount of articles about TikTok, a lot of them being favorable. Hey, here's how you use TikTok. Here's how you change your name. Here's how you get discovered. Here's how you publish more videos. All these kind of articles pushing people to try TikTok. Go create an account. Go create content. So where all the cool kids are, go make stuff there. Either that is the future of online content creation and where everybody is migrating to, or if I can put on my tinfoil hat, maybe all these companies, all these blogs are getting paid to write about TikTok. That's my theory, because a lot of it is surprisingly positive. There is one negative story that I saw about TikTok this week, and I will talk about it in this next section, which is what she had to say. The first comment comes from, I don't want a channel, I'm just commenting. They say, TikTok was designed to bring about the downfall of society. Maybe it's because I'm a dinosaur, but I remember a TV show called quote unquote dinosaurs. Yes, the one with the frying pan and pink baby who screamed, not the mama. Anywho, in season three, episode 32, question mark? The show explores what happens to society when when mindless content is fed to the masses. Spoiler, it doesn't go well. I don't want a channel, I'm just commenting. Thank you very much for that interesting idea. I do think you're correct that mindless content being force-fed to the masses does lead to negative social consequences. There's no denying that. I am just a little bit hesitant on whether or not TikTok was designed explicitly or with the explicit purpose of destroying society, leading to the downfall of society. However, I do think that inadvertently, all of these platforms having or developing algorithms that force feed content to people, maybe not force feed, but feed content to people with the explicit purpose of keeping their eyeballs, which I think is going is the most damaging thing, will potentially lead to the downfall of society. It's not as though these platforms and these algorithms were designed stating, destroy society, lead to the downfall of society. They were designed with keep eyeballs watching as long as possible so we can serve as many ads as possible. And that in turn might be what leads to, to the downfall of society because people are getting horrifying content because that is what ultimately makes them watch the longest. On the note of that, I was listening to a podcast this last week from Darren O'Neill. That's right, I tip my hat to the good sir ITM. I believe it was his show, Gent not Gentle Old Benz, Angry Old Benz, is that what it is? Why can't I, Grumpy Old Benz, why? <laughs> Angry Old Benz, Angry, Angry Old Benz. <laughs> why are they divers now? What am I doing? Grumpy Old Benz. And they were to talking. They were to talking. Give me fifty dollars so I can take speaking lessons. <laughs> Jesus Christ! We are not editing this at all. Point of the story: 
they were talking about a Wall Street Journal video where Wall Street Journal did a bit of testing on TikTok and they found that the algorithm is so quick at learning the profile of the individual about what they like and more importantly, what will keep them watching the longest that they were able to create this algorithmic profile to keep them watching within two hours. And one of the fake profiles they made was somebody interested in depression, somebody who was depressed. And within a couple of hours, they just got fed more and more depressing videos because that would keep them watching. Ultimately, that's probably going to be a terrible thing for somebody who is depressed, somebody who is miserable and feeling, having dark thoughts, being fed more and more content saying, hey, here's why you should feel terrible. Hey, here's why you should be depressed. Hey, harm. All, all these kind of videos were being fed to this, this algorithm, this, this fake profile. But that's the problem with all of these algorithm-based platforms. They don't exist to improve people's lives. They don't exist to help people. They exist to serve advertisements to you. They exist to make money. And the way that they make money is off of your eyeballs. So their only real goal is to make sure that you keep watching. And that is exactly what this Wall Street Journal thing found. But don't get me wrong, this is not just TikTok. We saw something very similar with Facebook, where Facebook would learn, oh, this person is depressed. Let's serve them ads where we can make the most money off of somebody who's depressed, whether it be alcohol or chocolate or razor blades or whatever it is that depressed people buy. That's what they are going to serve to you. They don't care about your mental well-being. They don't care about what is going to be beneficial or harmful to you. All they care about is, hey, how can we get more eyeballs? How can we increase that bottom line? And that's why this algorithm stuff is terrible. It's absolutely terrible. So I highly recommend watching that video. To reiterate my point, I don't think that TikTok or any of these websites were designed with the explicit purpose of destroying society or leading to the downfall of society. I simply think that it's an unhappy accident that all of these platforms have determined the best way to function is through algorithms because the platforms are so large. Those algorithms have the intent to keep people watching and increase revenue and increase the bottom line. And that means keeping you watching as long as possible. And that has a negative impact on society as a whole, it seems. Secondly, we have a comment from I apologize for mispronouncing your name, Cassio or Cassio. I apologize. He says, hey, Bandrew, I think you missed a small thing in your TikTok versus YouTube content delivery analysis. YouTube does, in fact, keep giving you content without requiring interaction. There's an autoplay option that comes enabled by default in the YouTube apps and in the website. You probably disabled that feature a long time ago because of the way you like to consume content. I did the same and then forgot that it existed and is the standard. Cassio or Cassio, thank you very much for the comment. And that is absolutely fair and you are correct. I have forgotten that YouTube has an autoplay feature and function built into it that may be on by default. I still think there's quite a big difference between YouTube and TikTok though. YouTube, you open up the app, it does not start playing content immediately content that's pre-selected knowing that it's going to draw me into a deep dark rabbit hole when i open up the youtube app it just says here are a bunch of recommendations click on click on them if you want to watch them and then perhaps it will autoplay the next video when i had tiktok on my old burner phone when i would open it up it would be on the for you tab and the video would start playing immediately it would start playing immediately. I would never watch a single video. I just scroll over to the place where I can upload a video of me throwing a box. But I think that's a big difference because with YouTube, you still need to make the active decision to click on video X, Y, or Z. Most of the time, I would guess this is an arbitrary number, just pulling it out of my butt. We all know 97.2% of stats are made up. 50% of YouTube is probably people actively selecting a video to watch. 
unless I'm misunderstanding the Wall Street Journal video that I was watching, I think 95% of TikTok videos are algorithm fed, just auto played to you through the For You tab. And I think that's the biggest difference. And also why I think TikTok is probably much worse, why I have zero desire to use it, because I tried searching on TikTok and when I was searching for a topic, I think I searched something that would be valuable on TikTok. The idea of how can you monetize content on TikTok. When I searched that, it gave me zero video results. It gave me zero video results. What was returned were a bunch of channels to follow. I don't want a bunch of channels to follow. If I'm searching how to monetize content on TikTok, I'm looking for a video that has an answer to that. I think they want you to follow channels so then they can go ahead and force feed you a video from them and then lead into about a thousand other videos. If you search for a piece of information and you get it on TikTok, you're done. You're done with your search. So I think there's two completely different methods of consumption on YouTube and TikTok and also two completely different types of content that thrive. Again, I will not be using TikTok. It scares the bejeebas out of me. Zero desire. I hate it even more now after watching that Wall Street Journal video. Now let's jump to my favorite part of the show, the Ask Bandrew segment. Welcome to the Ask Bandrew segment. If you have any questions, you can go to askbandrew.com. There are instructions on how to send in audio, video, and text-based questions. I do prefer audio and video because then I don't have to read. I am a big, stupid, fat, idiot person with big old man boobs, and my brain goes straight to my man boobs. <laughs> what am I talking about? <laughs> so I cannot read. Send in audio and video because that's better for all of us. You don't have to listen to me read. Golly, this show is off the rails. Let's jump to the first voice submission from Moon. Take it away, Moon. Hey, Banjo. I have bought the Samsung Q2U after many recommendations online, and I've encountered an issue. When compressing my audio when post-processing it, I've encountered a pretty high hiss noise flow, which is around minus 70 dB before post-processing. Is this normal? And will an interface reduce the issue? And if so, what interface would you recommend, which is relatively cheap, as I don't have a big budget? Around or under $150. I thought about getting the Audient Evo 4 if an interface will help, but I'm open to other recommendations as well. Okay, that is a very good question, and in order to answer it, we are going to do a very quick test. Currently, I have the Samsung Q2U running over USB into my Mac. My gain is set at 50%. I am then also running XLR out into the Focusrite 18i20 second gen. Pretty comparable preamps. I believe the Evo 4 is slightly better, so we'll be getting even more conservative figures here to see if the interface does improve that. So I will go, I've level matched them as close as I can. I'm hitting around negative 9 dB when I'm talking at this level, a couple inches off, pretty comparable. Sorry about that plosive. And I will go ahead and be quiet and we can look at the noise floor. And the audio will be getting loud now. Okay, there you go. That is a very quick test. I don't have the figures in front of me right now, but I will tell you what the solution is or what the answer to the question is right now. And the answer to the question, because I have gone back and listened to it and did a bit of analysis while running through the focus right, you are getting maybe a 2 dB improvement over the noise floor, but it's not a huge improvement. Now, I do believe that the Motu M2 has a couple dB improvement over the noise floor compared to the 18i20. The EIN of the 18i20 is negative 127, if I am not mistaken. 
and I believe the Motu is negative 130 dBA. I, I could be completely wrong, but I believe that is the case. Look it up because I am too lazy right now when I'm recording. That's what I believe. So if I'm getting a 2 dB improvement from the 18i20 to the Q2U, then you could expect an additional 2 to 3 dB improvement. So you'd probably be looking at going from negative 70 to negative 74 dB in terms of your noise floor. And that is really up to you on whether or not that's going to be a big enough improvement for you to justify that additional, what is it, $230 cost? That's up to you. I can't make that decision for you. But Moon, hopefully that was helpful. Next, we have an email from Jonathan. I'm not reading his entire email. It was kind of long. I am just jumping into his question. I record in a basement area with no sound treatment, but fairly tame reverb. I currently use a Snowball Ice and plan to purchase the Motu M2 and an SEV7. Your reviews review of the SEV7 was from a while ago when your mic technique was less than you do now. Sorry. And you didn't give your thoughts on its use for spoken word. So my question is, what are your thoughts on it for spoken word? Jonathan, thank you very much for the email. In order to answer it, you know we are going to do tests no, I am not currently speaking on the SEV7. I am speaking on the microphone the SEV7 is attempting to overtake or steal market share from, I believe. I am currently on the SM58, so you can hear what the industry standard sounds like. I have this connected to the Focusrite interface, gain at 100%, and I am maybe 3 to 4 inches off of the mic. Let me jump over to the SEV7 so you can hear how that sounds. And now I am on the SE Electronics SEV7. Same price point. I have my gain set at the exact same level, about the same distance away. And I am sure the first thing you noticed is the decrease in the low end. It doesn't sound as overpowered in the low end. And the top end sounds much more open. It sounds more natural, more airy, more clear. It is a more intelligible sound, although it is not going to be the ideal selection for everybody, I guess. Some folks might want that more radio broadcasty, really beefy low end. And not necessarily unclear, but just more vintagey sounding, darker sounding microphone. This gives you... A more balanced sound. As far as my thoughts for spoken word, I absolutely love this thing. I think it sounds incredible, especially given the $100 price point. Something else to consider is I am not sure about the longevity and the durability of the SEV7. It feels perfectly fine, but it doesn't have the track record that the SM58 has, mainly because the SEV7 hasn't been around for over 50 years. It hasn't been on tours for 50 years where people beat the living daylights out of it and it still works, where people run over it with their vans or their buses and it still functions. Does it sound good once the 58 has been run over by a bus or a van? No, but it still functions. I don't know about the durability of the v7 so that is something you need to take into account as well did i say 57 i meant i don't know about the durability of the sev7 as far as the tonal though the tonal characteristics of it the tonal what's the tonal i don't know what that means i enjoy this quite a lot for spoken word because it does have that clearer sound to it you can hear t -t -t -t. you can hear the articulation in my voice. It doesn't have that overpowered low end. It gives you a much more natural and balanced sound, which is something I personally prefer. That's not going to be what everybody prefers, so you need to make a decision on your own whether or not you want something that is darker, something that is tried and true, something that is an industry standard, or if you want something that is a little bit less well known, but it gives you a great sound, a sound that people may not be as familiar with. Those are decisions you get to make, and that's what's super exciting about it. But because I just have these sitting on my desk, we're going to do something else as well, because why the hell wouldn't we? 
All right, this was just sitting on my desk and I had to try it. I had to throw it on so you can hear this as well. This is a ribbon microphone. This is the Bayer Dynamic M160. I believe this is a $700 ribbon microphone. Absolute classic. I adore this thing because for a ribbon microphone, listen to that extension into the air frequencies. You don't hear that. Normally, ribbon microphones sound like this. I was exaggerating there. <laughs> you get the point. Ribbon microphones are very dark and muffled sounding, but this does a great job at extending into the air frequencies. So I just wanted to include that because it was sitting here. And we have one more that I'm going to throw in there just because. And now I am on the Neumann KMS-105, an absolute stunner of a handheld microphone, but this is a condenser mic. I wanted you to be able to hear the difference between a $700 handheld condenser microphone versus a couple of other options out there to really give you a better picture of what you're getting with the SEV7. Obviously, you're not going to be looking at this one because... 700 bucks and you're looking at a $100 microphone but I wanted to include it it was sitting on my desk I love this thing and this this is all for fun this is all for fun I enjoy playing with these microphones so I'm gonna play with them you can't tell me what to do you're not my dad and my dad can't even tell me what to he's not gonna tell me what microphone to use not gonna tell me don't think you can and here we are back on the SE Electronics SEV7 just to wrap it around and wrap it around. <laughs> can I say that on YouTube? <laughs> I don't think I can. <laughs> to conclude this section so you can hear, okay, we went SM58, SEV7 to the Bayer Dynamic M160 ribbon to the Neumann KMS105 back to the SEV7 just so you can hear it. A lot more condenser sounding than the SM58 is, if that is what you're going for. Hopefully that was helpful. Okay, next submission thing. And the last question this week is a voice submission from the Potter Discussion. Take it away, the Potter Discussion. Greetings, moonlings, and welcome back to Bloggage, the channel where we discuss everything blogs. Oh my gosh, who would have thunk it? I just threw the box my tablet came in because of how comedically genius that was. I promise I'm trying, Bandrew. Okay, I have a question. I am planning an audio upgrade, and I've narrowed it down to everything except the microphone. I'm planning to get and test three microphones, two of which are the Rode NT1 and the Rode Procaster. I have three microphones in mind that could consist of the third microphone in that test set. The three microphones I have narrowed it down to are the Bayer Dynamic M201TG, the Audio-Technica AT875R, and the Asden SGM250. Which of these three microphones should become the Valiant Third Musketeer in my quest for better audio? I love your podcast. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. I have to say, I felt as though I was getting roasted super hard by this kid. That was mean. And it cut deep. It hurt. Holy smokes. <laughs> that was hilarious. To the question, if I am understanding correctly, <laughs> you have the Rode Procaster and the Rode NT1. So you have already a very good dynamic microphone and a very good condenser microphone then you ask of these three microphones which one should you buy or which one would i recommend you get you list the buyer dynamic m201 tg the audio technica at875r or the asden sgm250 the buyer dynamic is one of my all-time favorite microphones and unfortunately this website has gone down but what is his name? Steve Albini used to have a review of the M201TG and it said, this is what the SM57 would sound like if it was an actual microphone because Albini hates the 57 apparently. But the M201TG, one of my all-time favorites. However, you already have a really good broadcast dynamic microphone. So I think you'd be better off getting a shotgun microphone 
And I have no idea. I have zero information. I have never used. I have never looked into the Asden mics. So I don't know how that performs. I don't know if it's any good. I don't know if it sucks. What I do know is the AT-875R by Audio-Technica sounds great. It is affordable and it performs admirably for the price. And that is why it's on my favorite podcasting microphones, the 12 favorite podcast mics, because I think it sounds incredible. If you get it three to six inches away from you, you can get some outstanding tones on it. And then you can use it as a standard short shotgun microphone right out of frame if you need to do that. The Bayer Dynamic M201TG, I don't necessarily think you need that because you already got the Procaster, which sounds great. Maybe, maybe if you're miking up instruments, but I don't think you need that. I would go the 875R currently because you got the dynamic, you got the large diaphragm condenser, throw in a shotgun microphone as well, and you ought to be off on the races to the races, not on the races. Who's on the race? Racists? I don't know. What would that, what would be, what would on the races be? I'm confused now. I confused myself. That is it for this episode. I have nothing else because my brain is ceasing to function. <laughs> I have had a difficult time speaking. Give me $50 so I can learn to speak, so I can take speaking lessons because I am a moron. That is it for this week. I love you all. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for listening or watching. I hope you have an amazing Saturday, Sunday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, next Saturday, and then the following Sunday. I will talk at you. Jeez Louise. Oh boy, we are not editing this. You're seeing the warts and all this week. It's a rough one. Okay, I will talk to you all on a later date. Bye-bye. Do I, do I even remember how to turn off a recording or am I just completely brain dead now? Stop recording now. This has been a Geeks Rising production. Your executive producer is Bandrew Scott. For more information, head over to www dot geeksrising dot com